everyone and welcome to the fifth event in our new series, Your Path to Farm Transition. I'm Patty Durand, a business advisor with FCC, and I'm excited to be here with you today. In our previous event, uh, my teammate Joel Bokenfor asked you to think about assembling your advisory team. Professionals such as lawyers, accountants, financial planners outside of your family business that you can ask to collaborate and advise with your best interests in mind. You don't have to figure out your transition plan alone. There are experts to help you reach the goals you have in mind. Our topic today, which is always a hot one, wills and estate planning, is a task that is a key for your farm family members in transition. It's also a task that is best supported by a legal profession in the area where you and your business is located. You may be surprised to know that laws regarding wills and estates vary from province to province. So today we want to provide good information and our ultimate goal that Tom and I have talked about is as a result of attending this webinar, you will book an appointment to review or update your will. Now, let's get started. I am really happy to introduce Dr. Tom Deans. Tom may be familiar to you as he has spoken at several FCC events and webinars over the years. Many are available on our website if you wanna learn more from him. Tom, you got a mouthful here. You are an intergenerational wealth management expert and you know the value of estate planning and tools such as wills for members of your family. Hi, Tom. Patty, great to join you. Super glad that this is uh, something that we are planning and collaborating together because that's actually one of our themes is collaboration is a powerful thing. Tom, I'd like you to set the scene. Can you describe in your mind why would each and every farm family team member make it a priority to have an up-to-date will in place? Well, I think the quick answer, Patty, it's a great place to start, is that, you know, life unfolds in unpredictable ways. We, we carry around an idea that we will live as long as our parents or our grandparents, like, or maybe a little bit longer, because we are living longer. Uh, but the reality is, for some of the people listening today, life will intervene in the most unprecarious way. And I just think we just need to prepare for that. That's the first point. The second point is we often equate estate planning, which is what will preparation and power of attorney and a healthcare directive. We're going to get into all those details in a moment. We always think that those, those three documents are for really old people. In other words, there's a lot of people who think they can just, they'll just know exactly when the perfect time to go in and get these three documents in place and, and then it'll just be, that's just the way it is. Well, the, you and I both know it just doesn't work that way. Um, we have an increasing number of Canadians uh, who are being challenged with cognitive impairment. Like dementia is a huge, huge and growing problem in this country because we are living longer, longer than our parents, longer than our grandparents. And this is, so this is just a, this is a wrinkle that has really impacted estate planning because if we lose cognitive function, it is actually then too late. If we lose capacity, it is too late to execute these documents, which is why the perfect time, are you ready for this? The perfect time to write a will is when you are 18. 18, the day after you turn 18, because the law says you're now no longer a minor, you're an adult. The law doesn't Beautiful. say you're a young adult. It says you're an adult. And if you're an adult, even if you've got modest assets, and again, I'm going to come back to this point in a big way. It's not just about dividing assets. That's, there's, a, there's so much more to estate planning than just answering the question, who gets my stuff? So the perfect time to get a will is when you are when you turn 18. The next best day is the day after that. So if you're 43 and you don't have a will, the next best day to get a will would be when, oh, I don't know, this webinar ends, like right today. <laughs> Book an appointment, get it done. This is, I cannot underscore how important this subject is. Uh, we're gonna get into it, but it, it, it will cause so much confusion and chaos and all sorts of financial challenges when we when we don't have these documents in place. So it's an opportunity we all have. If you're watching this webinar and you're 18 or older, we're speaking to you. 
So ideally, we're giving you good motivation and inspiration to be motivated to go and review or update your will. So we'll dig in a little bit further. Something that I want you to be aware of as an attendee, this is a topic we get many, many questions on and we have, um, Tom has a wealth of experience and, and um, it's something that we really want to make sure we uh, make that an opportunity for you. So in the questions and in the chat, you are absolutely welcome to post questions. Actually, if you go to the questions tab is ideal and that way I can make sure that I weave them in. We're going to spend the first 30 minutes in kind of a, a general overview and, and think about helping you to think about some assumptions you might be making about your estate planning. And we're going to offer a little bit of a reframe perspective on that. But then the second half is going to be all live questions. And so this event will be what you make it. Please uh, put your thoughts forward and uh, let's spend some time on it. Okay, Tom, uh, we, there, you, you touched on a number of things um, in, in your opening statement and I just, Thank you for that. I will say that some of the assumptions, and I think you just touched on this, people make the assumption, I will know the perfect time to make my will. How can this assumption be unhelpful? Well, the reality is we don't know what we don't know, and we can never know everything. So what we do know is that when we understand that and we can utter those words, we know that we have to get these documents in place. And, and the, or, the only re way that I can really make this point is when someone dies, what's called intestate, that is without a legal will, then the province in which they live, the province, the provincial government has a formula for dividing up that, that estate, that farming operation, that manufacturing company, that retail business, that According to that formula, there is no wiggle room. There's no discretion. And a government will appoint a public trustee to make those, to, to administer that estate, to administer that formula. So there's just a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, Patty, 12.5 million Canadians don't have a will. Adults, 12.5, close your eyes and try to picture, picture, picture a, a, you know, a major sporting arena with you know, 30,000 people in it. Now try to picture 12.5 million Canadian adults without a will. It is such a staggering number. That is why this, this event is so important because if we can just create a little bit of excitement around what a will is and move it away from this, I don't know, this idea that it's a sad document, it's, it's intimidating, it's complex. If we can move people away from that idea to, hey, no, it's actually, it's actually a really fun document to have written and drafted. It's a, it's a fun document that you can use to engage the people in your life that matter most. And it's a really, I don't know, it gives a real sense of accomplishment that you're forward looking and that you're a planner, right? We know that people who, who, who don't plan fail. They plan to fail. And the reverse is people who actually get this document. So I... Go ahead. No, I just want to insert because I think I think you're right. I, I think that there's um, great potential and um, there's it's it can be um, uh, intimidating. I feel like getting to be uh, will getting to be fun is a bit of a stretch, <laughs> but it can be powerful and it can be meaningful and it can provide me a peace of mind. So let's maybe try to in there. I would also offer that yes, there are a large number of people that don't have wills. I'm really happy to say that of the many farm families that I have had the opportunity, and I'm going to say hundreds at this time, many of them do have wills. So I don't want to discount that, and I would offer that probably many of these that do have wills, but do want to dig in a little deeper and are still struggling with some of the decisions. And so um, will they know the perfect time? No, but now is the perfect time. Is that fair? That is, that is fair, and, and certainly for the people who are listening in who do have wills, it is uh, really crucial that they review those documents on an annual basis. I often hear it's important to review them every five years. Holy smokes, Patty, think about the last five years and what's changed in your life. I know what's changed in my life, and I've had occasion to change my will three times in the last five years. It's just amazing. Um, new people were born into our family, which changed my beneficiary designation and the formula for dividing my assets. I had one of my beneficiaries predecease me, so that, that caused a change. Um, 
So there's always things that are evolving. This idea that a will is kind of one and done is, is really a little bit of a dangerous idea. It really is a living document that we should revisit on an annual basis uh, and update that. And it doesn't take very much time and it's not that expensive. There's something called a, called a codicil. I know we, uh, the whole subject is kind of full of technical jargon, but this thing called a codicil is, a, is an easy, inexpensive way to make an amendment to a will without having to redraft the entire document. So when you go and talk to a, an estate lawyer, they will, um, they'll talk to you about that, right? They will talk to you about how to do that. And I think when people understand the basics, and when I mean the basics, part of what we're trying to do today is make this subject accessible and strip away the intimidating Latin words. Like I could say testator, and I, at about three out of 10 people would know what that means. A testator is the person whose will is being drafted, right? My will, I'm the testator of my will. So we can, we can strip away that stuff and just say, you know, go talk to a lawyer. Um, if they speak kind of over your head, ask them to stop and repeat that in a way that you understand. Use plain language. And I, I think when people feel empowered to do that, they're gonna end up with a better will better estate plan, and more informed beneficiaries. And that's kind of leading into a subject that I know we want well, to talk about. Which I, is... You know what, actually, you, you, you pick Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. I, I do want to just insert, because I think you said something important um, about, about the review. And I will offer that one of the stage in, in the past of farm transition they're going to be focusing on is business planning. And I think it's a really great compliment. So does my will still reflect the promises I've made? Does it still reflect the people? Does it still reflect the assets and the debts and the obligations? And so when we think about review, especially with farm transition in mind, there's a lot of moving parts. And so that's why it becomes so critical to dust it off. I've sat across, and I'm sure you've had this experience from people, they're like, yeah, our will's a little out of date. And I'm like, okay, well, your child is 43 and they still have a guardian if you pass away. So, yeah, I'm going to agree. We can do better. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, uh, I, 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 think you've really, I think you've really hit the nail on the head, Patty. I think there are people who have added to their farming operations. They've added equipment. They've added, they've added land. Uh, and, if they, and I think when they go back and look at their wills and they look at the assumptions that they think they have made, it, it, it's remarkable how outdated, even the selection of an executor is something that should be reviewed on an annual basis. Just touching base with that executor and making sure that they still agree to that, perform that role. It's a, it's a daunting administrative task to, to be an executor. And just touching base with that executor and making sure that they're still all in to do the work is just really good best practices. Absolutely. I, I like that. I think it's easy to say best practices, some practices. As a general rule, here's something that help you out. And so those touch bases can be a big deal. I completely agree. So let's shift to our next assumption. Things we hear from farm business people that we speak with. Our kids get along great. Therefore, our estate will be easy to settle. You want to comment? Yeah. Um... Your, your video and your audio is lagging a little bit, but I, I did piece together the question. I'm going to repeat it um, for the audience. Uh, we often make the assumption that our kids get along great now. So, you know, when I, when I pass away, things will just continue on as, as they are right now. In truth, um, I like to say that when the last parent dies, the glue in the family is gone. That last senior member of that generation, when they pass, Families kind of retreat to their own nuclear family. They retreat to their own corners. That is to say, if there hasn't been preparation, including family meetings that, you know, bring some discussion in form and best practices to the transition of the family farm, right? When we skip that communication piece, often, often kids do actually, the relationships fray. People want what they want for their own families. They become their own patriarch or matriarch of their own nuclear family. 
And so this assumption that everything will be fantastic, everything will continue on, in some cases it will. But in many, many cases, we know just from the volume of families that are litigating, uh, finding themselves in court, fighting over the division of a farming operation or, or any kind of business, we know that that volume is the scorecard that families are having these conversations. That is part of today's call to action, right? This idea of families coming together and peering into the future and saying, how will this farm transition? What, what do you kids want? What is fair? What is equal? How do we treat kids off farm? Um, how do we keep concepts of equality alive when some want to farm and some don't want to farm? How do we get the family to engage openly in these conversations with the help of trusted advisors, accountants, lawyers, wealth advisors, so that families can bring predictability to the most inevitable thing in life, and that is the transition of the farm to someone. It's going somewhere. So I think the really, really smart leaders of farming operations are saying, I'm going to get out in front of this. I'm going to do a better job. And I'm going to, I'm going to oh, I can't resist a farming metaphor. I'm going to take the bull by the horns and I am going to get, <laughs> I'm going to get, I'm going to get this stuff really buttoned down. And I'm going to do it with the help of my advisors, and I'm going to do it with the help of my beneficiaries. You see, there is something that is going on, and I think it's at the core of why 12 and a half million Canadians don't have a will. I think we, we think that we have to sit in our office or in a, at our kitchen table and scribble out a will and have a perfect document, and we've got to arrive at the perfect decisions all by ourselves. And the reality is some of the best wills that are crafted are born from a collaboration, from conversation with family members and saying, like, what do, you, what do you guys think? Like, what do you want? And how will we deal with this? What are your ideas? What, are, what does your vision of the future look like? And it is remarkable how many times the answer is in the room. And it's not a technical answer. It's a, it's a, it's an answer born from repeated conversations about the transition of a farm. And I just think when a family can really make major decisions before they go and visit their lawyer to get this document properly drafted. Yes, you can scribble a will on a piece of paper. It's called a holographic will. But please, I would really encourage you. There's some exceptional lawyers uh, in communities straight across this country that know how to take common conversations like we're having and and craft a will that is durable that is that is resilient and sound so that when in the fullness of time someone dies someone gets that will an executor and they can they can administer that estate seamlessly relatively quickly compared to the family that's been left in chaos so i think a nuance there that i want to just build on is i really appreciate that um, assumption, I would say, is that, you know, this is something that you have to do independently in isolation. And it isn't for everyone, but I certainly have witnessed how fruitful it can be rather than giving your heirs necessarily authority over your will, but ask them, like, what do you expect? What, what's in your mind? What are you thinking? So that you don't have to come up with every idea yourself. This doesn't have to be something that is is this this logic puzzle, this impossibility that you have to arrive at. And so, just opening those doors of possibility. Um, you have a farm team that has unique skills and strengths. That might be something you might be able to put to work. Right, Patty. Because the opposite of what you just described is secrecy. Mm. And then. And then in the fullness of time, the secrets are revealed. The will is read and people go, oh, oh my goodness, why did dad do that? Or why didn't mom do this? Or, oh my gosh, now we're all equal partners in a farming operation, except one kid's a dentist and the other one's a teacher and only one is on the farm. Like, how is that going to work? Absolutely, no absolutely. Conversation. So, so then that leads to the next one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no. 
and lots of, I was just gonna say, and lots of different variations on that. Like secrecy seldom produces extraordinary family dynasties, right? So, so <laughs> then that's the, that's the next assumption is that there seems to be a, a long belief and assumptions that wills and estate planning are meant to be kept secret. Um, how would you address that? I can only responsibly speak from my own personal experience where I grew up in a family that had transparency and we had family meetings and we had our advisors in those meetings. Um, so it was, a, I, I'm learning that that was a little bit weird. It's, 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 it's becoming more common, particularly with larger, larger business businesses where there's more complexity. If there's a, a farm, a cottage, boats, lots of stuff scattered across the country, even assets held outside the country. With that level of complexity, if you're not having family meetings and preparing the next generation for where these assets are and where they're going and how they will transition, and how tax will be triggered by the transition of those assets. If families aren't having those meetings, good luck. Or if someone has, you know, uh, made the decision to make maybe a, one of their children who lives in the U.S. executor in some provinces, that's a real challenge. It's going to cause some some tax consequences. There is enormous complexity, and it and you made the point in your introduction right across this country. The estate laws in BC are very different from Nova Scotia and very different from Newfoundland and Ontario. It's just, it's just, it's a provincial area and people need good legal advice. And if people- So I'm going to pick up on something. Yeah, no, I, go ahead. Forgive me, I'm just going to pick up on something. So complexity. Um, I, I do think about, uh, you know, the generic will divided equally amongst my heirs. When you have no assets, when you have like a house and a car, it's a much different conversation than all of the layers. Like think about the asset list on a farm and the complexities that brings. So absolutely, it, it's deeper than just a, a quick high level um, um, estate plan. But I really think it's important to address this. Tom, are you specifically saying people should be sharing their wills? I would say that that is an aspirational goal. I think when families can get to that place where they've had many, many conversations with their children, especially, I mean, most wills, we leave our assets to our children, we'd leave some to charity. In some cases where we don't have children, we're leaving assets to friends who have, particularly friends who have helped out with late in life care. Um, but I'm saying as an aspirational goal. That so is, then work towards that? towards that and when we have family meetings where we're where we're building our estate plan our will with feedback and input from the people who will be impacted by the decisions we make like leaving them a farm it's not a huge leap to then say so here's a copy of my will right you can if i were to say patty everyone on this call must share their will without having those prior conversations that's weird that would be weird, probably ill-advised. It is the conversations. It's the tweaking and the changing of the wills. And also that proviso that says, hey, life will change and I may change my will. In other words, creating some space and flexibility for just because I'm sharing my will that has been born out of conversation doesn't mean that I can't change it. Life changes. People are, okay. new children are born. Some people die. Uh, some people uh, who have been interested and in participating in, in the farm pivot and pursue different careers. That would be a good time maybe to revisit the will and make a change. It doesn't necessarily mean you're removing someone. It just means that that farm transition plan will change. And those estate planning documents, will, power of attorney, should keep pace with those decisions that have changed. That's why it's really important to review those documents annually. So then, um, and I think you've described this to me and I appreciated this analogy or this explanation. There's a spectrum of transparency. You might have zero transparency. You might have 100% transparency. Wherever you are on that spectrum, reflect on it. If your 
will has transfer of farm assets, how will that impact? I think you had a statistic. Um, how many people are impacted in the case of a farm estate? Um, yes, it's typically like a, 10, that, a 10 multiplier. A 10 multiplier. Wow. So, so flip it. When someone dies in test state, that is dies without a will, there are 10 very close family members or friends that are deeply impacted by that lack of planning. Uh, the, the opposite is when you do have a will and it's been well communicated, built collaboratively, shared, lots of, lots of intergenerational planning, um, those 10 people go, wow, I mean, what an amazing mother or father. I mean, sure, we knew this day was coming. And of course, we can grieve now because we, there's nothing else to Absolutely. do. We all know exactly yeah, how, how it's going to transition, right? So um, it doesn't have to be drafted in isolation. Start with a conversation. It's not granting authority, but asking for feedback and thinking about everybody's long-term objectives and preserving those relationships. Yeah, and Patty, the very first casualty of estate planning is perspective. What are we talking about? We're talking about transitioning surplus wealth, surplus value on our death. There are people in this country where there is nothing to transition. There is, there's actually net debt. This is the right kind of problem to have. It really is. It really is. There's, right. two, types, there's two types of estates. Ones with brackets around them, negative value, good farming operations built by people leaning into their work, taking risk, making good informed decisions, building value, building something material. And then all I'm saying, what we're saying is that transition piece, lean into that too. Lean into it and give it some attention. And when you do, you will be remembered. In fact, I argue in my book, Willing Wisdom, that how we transition our wealth, our farm, is actually as important as what or how much we transition. People will actually remember, it's like, I remember mom and dad having these family meetings and they took such extraordinary care and invested such incredible effort to make sure that we were up to speed and in agreement so that when they died, we actually have a family that works well when they're not here. What a lovely, lovely gesture. What a beautiful way to start estate planning. How can I build a family that works well without me? Absolutely, in your absence. That's a legacy. A legacy. Uh, so I have, uh, I have another assumption, and I, I, you touched on this just briefly, but I, I do kind of want to go down this path. Um, kind of the perception that being named an executor is this, this blessing and honor. And not that it isn't something that is trusted, but it's, there's a lot attached to it. And can you comment on that, please? Yeah, well, so first of all, it's, it's not kind of like a gut feel. It's a hard job. It's a brutal job, and it comes with serious legal undertakings. There's no wiggle room. It's not like some people, you know, this is one of the first casualties of not having a family meeting. When people don't know what a state basic estate planning concepts are, like what is an executor? Who is that? People start to make assumptions that um, if mom and dad have selected one child to be the executor, Clearly, they love them the most. And of course, if you've ever been an executor, you'll be convinced that your parents love you the least. It is brutal. It is a hard, difficult, mind-numbingly detailed job, uh, canceling phone bills, uh, filing a terminal tax return. This is not sexy or fun stuff. Um, and I think one of the great agenda items for a family that decides to do things differently and have a family meeting and start to do the kind of things that we've been talking about is that they could talk about who should be an executor. Make that one of the very first family conversation pieces. 
and you know, get a victory in the, you know, a check mark in the, in the victory column, right? You're gonna get a family discussion that's gonna end really well. It might be all the kids decide to be executor. None of them wanna be executor. Like what a great way to kick off a meeting, a family meeting about the transition of a farm. So that again, compare that with the family that's arriving at a funeral home and finding out that only one child has a copy of the will because they were the executor. So mom and dad gave them a copy and they show up at the funeral home and they're making the funeral arrangements because they are the executor and then the legal authority to do so in many provinces. And then the other family members are like, well, why didn't they ask us to do it? How come we're not co-executors? And they feel hurt. Yeah. And this is how the administration of an estate or farm transition begins with siblings in dispute or someone with hurt feelings. So this is actually, I have a really relevant example. I was actually talking, speaking, my husband and I were talking with our 21 year old daughter just recently and explaining that we had selected a, a close family friend that lives in this province um, to be our executor. And she was actually offended. She's like, I'm really responsible. Like I'm an adult, I can do this. and. I was able to explain to her that this actually isn't judgment of her abilities, but recognizing that this can be a significant task and to just leave her holding that bag isn't her intention. Now, she will gain that ability and that will come with time. Ideally, we don't, it's a long time, we don't need it, but clarifying the reason for the selection actually was a really important conversation with her. Mm -hmm. No, I, I like that. And I think, you know, maybe I, I'm going to issue a personal challenge for you would be at your next family meeting to invite your accountant or lawyer and let your let your children meet them. Right. Because th they're likely going to be a resource in the administration of your estate. So what a great gift to give your kids when they actually have a, a little bit of a relationship already established. There's tremendous benefits that can come when, you know, kids have that familiarity with wealth managers, accountants, lawyers, um, and they already have, they already have a, a basis from, from which to work. Absolutely. So we'll transition to some questions here, pun intended, uh, with our transition theme. Um, there was a particular comment, and uh, uh, so Cameron Wilson commented, I could use uh, uh, with my farm families doing transition and estate planning, uh, it comes from, it's a quote that he uh, has from Warren Buffett. He says, I rewrite my will and discuss it with my children every five years, because once you're gone, there's no way to express your wishes unless a Ouija board really works. <laughs> so <laughs> um, let them ask questions while you're on the right side of the grass, maybe is the, is the message there. But there, here's a question. Um, you mentioned there being issues if selecting an executor out of Canada. Are there similar issues when you have an out of province executor? For example, the farm is in Manitoba and the executor lives in Saskatchewan. Yeah, that's, that's a really specific legal question. And that would, so there's a perfect example of a question that someone should take to their, to their lawyer. It, it will depend. Excellent. It will depend on, on where the farming operation is, are the assets are in, different, in different provinces. There are a lot of variables. And you know that's why there are lawyers who do nothing but write wills all day. Like they don't do divorce in the morning and real estate in the afternoon and then write wills in the afternoon, like, at, right? They're doing this full time because in, in many respects of all the areas of law, this is actually one that moves very quickly. There's lots of case law every year and lots of provincial and international complexity, which is why I keep picking on one particular office products supply company who sells a will kit. Okay, Staples, please don't, please don't go there and spend $20. This is not a race to the bottom for the cheapest will or power of attorney. Spend a little money, a little money to get really good local tailored advice specific to your farming operation. Patty, you used a phrase, one of a kind. There are not two people on this call today that have a, an estate plan that is identical. We are all different. Our kids are different, our relationships are different, our assets are different, they're in locations that are different. Like this is not something you wanna to try to do on your own, like a little weekend warrior project. This is, this is, this is for your entire life's work. Get good advice. Absolutely.
And so that's actually a, a good a good segue. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, do you have a comment or, or an observation in terms of what is fair compensation for an executor? Okay, so again, the provincial requirement or the provincial uh, regulations will allow for, uh, in Ontario, it's typically between three and 6% of the value of the state can go to the executor, which again, if this has not been discussed with other siblings, siblings can lose their mind when they find out that mm -hmm. the one child who's been appointed by their mother and father in secrecy to be executor is gonna get 6% more than their brothers or sisters for, on a $10 million farm, do the math. Like it's not a trivial, trivial amount. Even if it's a small amount, often the other siblings who are not executors, they have no appreciation for how many hours of work goes into the administration of the state. Again, which is why I keep coming back that the selection of an executor is the perfect agenda item for a family meeting to get it out have everyone in agreement so there are no surprises. Okay, okay. Uh, so continuing that theme, um, I have heard that a third party executor can ease the transition uh, on those you love. Uh, do you have thoughts on this, pros or cons? And then someone else also asked, what do lawyers charge? So I think that's kind of the same theme of conversation. Yeah, so uh, trust companies will provide a service where they administer estates. Um, there are yeah, professional trustees that, that can do the job. Um, and then there's also something like a hybrid halfway between, say, a family member or a brother and sister being co-executor and a public trustee. There are some options that will allow you to, the executor, say the kids, to hive off some of the administrative work to, to a professional trustee. So so like there's a hybrid, but again, in a family meeting where you're, where kids are like, yeah, we don't mind, you know, doing some of the work, but some of it will maybe because we have a large farming operation, for example, we, um, we actually going to need some administrative support. Mom and dad would be like, yeah, it makes total sense. Let's go find that, find that organization or firm that does that and let's get them on board and let's get them signed up. So when that day happens, boom, we're ready. Like that's just good planning. Absolutely. Start the conversation and ask the question for sure. And this actually, this, this comment I, I really appreciate. Bob said, getting to the point of sharing a will isn't easy and then even harder to explain to change to a will. It sounds like the right approach is to lead the family meeting to discuss what the will does or contain um, or will contain before sharing the document. I, I think he's really hurt us. I, I really think that, um, that uh, your message is, uh, is, is being received. Yeah, I, th I think Bob really is, I mean, he's cutting right to the core of the issue. I mean, for me to say to my kids, you know, right out of the blue, here's a copy of my will. These are the decisions I've made. I hope you, uh, hope you agree. And if you don't, well, too bad. Like, it's a weird conversation. But compare that to this. Hey, kids, your mother and I would like to have a family meeting. No, we're not dying. We're fine. But we just want, you know, we're getting older. Um, I just turned 60. Um, you know, it's, it's just time that we, we start to get you guys up to speed with where things are. Uh, we have a safety deposit box. Uh, here's where the key is. We have a will. Um, here's where it is. Um, but we need to, you know, we always, we really kind of want to start having more details. We want to share more details with you. What are your thoughts? Like ask the kids the question. What do you, what do you think about having that conversation? It's just getting started. It's like that first family meeting just feels improbable. It just feels like a huge mountain to climb, which is why I say, you've heard me say it before, you can eat a cow one burger at a time, right? If you said, you want to share your will, it feels like that's, that's overwhelming. But if you say, let's have one family meeting and let's try to tackle one little tiny little subject and get people comfortable with the idea of talking about aging, the transition of our business, the transition of our wealth. And let's just see how it goes. Newsflash, it's gonna go better than you think. It's gonna go better than you think. Yeah. It is actually- So a, fa a favorite- It's, it's the me, silence that's destroying relationships. The people who are left with this idea that if, they're, if my parents aren't talking to us about it, they don't trust us. And that could be the furthest thing from the truth. But that's what people are left with. 
I have a, a story that I'll share that um, I think speaks to a lot of these things. So with the collaboration in mind and understanding expectations, um, I had a uh, farm owner who uh, approached his children to ask them, you know, we're reviewing our will, what do you expect to inherit? And he was reluctant to share it with his in-laws because he didn't, you know, he did his, his daughters and sons-in-law, but he didn't, wasn't comfortable to tell them not to respond. And he was really glad he had hesitated because his son-in-law responded, I expect to inherit the right to view the photos of you enjoying your retirement. Wow. I think there's a lot of people that have great intentions. That's probably pretty extreme. I mean, there's dollars on the line as well. Sure. But opening those doors, you said it could be, it could probably be better than you, than you imagine. If it's out of line, if their expectations are way outside, then you can address that. It actually opens possibilities and you have the opportunity to um, respond uh, as opposed to when it's too late. Yeah, and, and you know, Patty, it really brings up this point about disclosure. And I can tell you that in our family, there's always context. And that context revolves around the cost of late in life care. My last surviving grandmother lived to 99 and we spent, are you sitting down? $1.5 million of after-tax money providing really good 24-hour in-home care. That's good. That was in 2011. That was $150,000 for 10 years. That number is closer to $225,000 now and rising. So when, so when we're talking to our kids about what they might inherit, and they understand our assets and where, what we have and where it is, we're also quick to remind them that if we live to 99, that big number they just heard could be ground down and be appreciably smaller. Because we don't wanna be Absolutely. a financial burden to our children. So that's why we continue to work and save and invest and be responsible with our wealth. But if I'm hopping on a plane to Washington right after this webinar. If my plane goes down, it will be, I will be very sad, but my kids will also be sad, but they will not be surprised. There will be no financial surprises. As a parent, I have prepared them for that day. I hope it doesn't happen, but they're prepared. And I feel like that's a, a, a duty and a responsibility for someone who's worked very hard to build a business I feel like I, I feel like it's just smart planning to prepare them for all of those eventualities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think too what you're describing, like these are these are documents we ho hope that you have and never need, or don't need for quite some time. But it's when you need them and don't have them that, especially the risk to farm business, is really significant. Uh, another question. Um, just to clarify a, a previous comment, are executor fees stated in the will? How are they decided? Again, it, that will depend on the province. Again, get that's a very, very specific legal question. Talk, talk to your lawyer. I think we might have lost Patty. Are you still there, Patty? We're getting we're getting glitchy tech issues again, but we'll we'll keep trying here. Um, can you hear me okay now? I can. Okay, perfect. So next, uh, do you have any advice on starting a conversation surrounding a will and estate planning with someone that doesn't seem to want to talk about it? That is a really great great question, and often beneficiaries, children, when the subject is raised they will often say, they'll shut it down. They will feign an indifference. They're like, and it is often a way of demonstrating people's commitment to their parents. Like, I don't wanna know this stuff. I trust you because I love you and respect you enough that I don't need to know anything. And in many cases, I, I understand the sentiment, but people really do need to persevere and say, no, you don't understand. It's complex and we need to talk about this and you need to know where the documents are located. We've only talked, Patty, in, in detail about wills, 
I've made reference to a power of attorney, POA. Power of attorney is a document uh, that gives someone power of attorney, responsibility, legal authority to, for example, if we're unconscious or on a ventilator because of COVID, gives, we appoint someone to run our financial affairs as if in our best interest, they become our fiduciary. If a power of attorney doesn't even know that they're the power of attorney, it's kind of useless, right? Or if the power of attorney, say I select my daughter to be my power of attorney and I don't give her a copy of the power of attorney and I'm unconscious because I'm in a car accident, the great scavenger hunt begins. Time is of the essence. Yeah. People need to make decisions. That's what a family meeting does. It's like, here's my document. I have a copy of my parents' documents. They're in their 80s. They have copies of mine. Now, when our kids turn 18, we buy them wills. I think I've, you've heard me say this, Patty. They're very disappointed. They're hoping for cars. They get wills. Very disappointed <laughs> children. But, we, but that's what we do. We parent. We parent on the subject of estate plan. It's incredibly important. So I'm going to, I'm going to build on the comment in terms of starting the conversation and when someone doesn't seem to want to talk about it, I certainly have been in situations where they were, um, I try to talk to my daughter about it, but every time I do, she cries, or I've tried to talk up to my dad about it and he shuts down. And so uh, one piece of advice, which has been recommended to me by a legal professional that I think, and, and I feel like I've heard you say it before, we can lead by example. So if we ourselves have our affairs in order and can say, here, I'd like to share with you a copy of my will because I want you to be clear about what, and, and that would be my personal choice. Everybody has their own discretion, but I'm going to choose to do that and say, here's what um, I would like. Here's my intentions. Here's my wishes. Um, and I hope at some point you will feel the same to be able to share those back with me. So yeah. in those situations, we have the opportunity to lead by example. I agree. So yeah, so for the younger people on the call who are frustrated that their parents won't engage on this subject or lead, lead by example, yeah, those younger people can share their documents with their parents. And then maybe there's immediate reciprocity. Sometimes it may take mm -hmm. a little bit of time, but parents will be like, well, that is just so weird because they're just acting so mature and responsible about this subject. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and the other benefit, the other benefit is that grandparents get to see how their wealth will flow through their children to their grandchildren. If they have a copy of their own children's wills, they can see who they've named as beneficiaries. So we've talked about aspirational goals. Really the and I've been a speaker inside family meetings with three generations sharing their documents. They have a 50 year vision for their farm, for their business, for their family, because they've used the opportunity of time to build plans in an open, transparent way. And it does yeah. not happen overnight. This is a family that, that has worked for decades on on this core value we are so busy creating wealth we are so exhausted by building bigger farming operations that we forget that it's going somewhere and that it requires energy and planning and conversation to make sure that it continues to to do well in the future in the hands of the right people and when we do that, that's how we build really resilient farming operations, farming families, and farming communities. Absolutely. Well, and I, and I think, and I, I know I've heard you say, and it's, it's commonly referred to from Stephen Covey in terms of, you know, seven habits of highly effective people, beginning with the end in mind. So in this whole path with to try, to try, farm transition and your path, that end, what does that look like? Thinking about that, spending time on that. We also have a ton of respect for the fact that this is complex. There's many layers to this. There's a lot of things going on. And so in order to collect your thoughts before going to your professional, um, FCC is actually collaborating with Dr. Tom Deans to put together a um, tool called the Farm Transition Pre-Planning Estate Tool. And Tom, can you offer some comments on it? Uh, we're planning this for next spring, spring of 2023. It will be available to any farm in Canada. Um, 
give us a little bit of a preview, Tom. Yeah, this this tool is, if I have to say so myself, it is it is it is incredibly powerful. It requires someone though, Patty, to invest upwards of eight to ten minutes of their life. That's eight to ten minutes of their life that they're never going to ten back. minutes. You know, <laughs> that could actually change the the future of their family forever. Uh, you know, it is a really easy to use. It's a checklist. There's 60 questions on the checklist. And at the end of that eight to 10 minutes filling out those answering the questions, yes, no answer questions, someone is going to get an incredible 20 page personalized report showing things that they're doing really well and areas where they can improve. So it has very, very specific recommendations on how to work with professionals to really do the kinds of things that we've been talking about. Eight to 10 minutes. It's fast. It's fun. You get a score. And more importantly, you can do it over and over and over. So as you start to implement some of the recommendations, you can redo the checklist and raise your score. It was kind of fun. We're putting the fun back into a state. It's never been there, actually. So, <laughs> you were convinced this is fun. Is I'm so... <laughs> I, I'm I, I'm excited by your enthusiasm, but I fun. I yeah, we'll we're, we'll work on that. But I will say that this tool is going to be. Um, you will be notified if you're registered for these events. You'll be notified when that tool is available, and so we invite you to to use it to share it. It is something that as business advisors, as we've been sitting at the kitchen tables with farm families, we can instruct. Yes, go get and, and update your will. But we respect that it is. There's many layers to it. And so we had a really strong desire to put a stronger farm customized tool into your hands. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we're really excited to share that with you. Okay. Um, and I, I just got a comment here that I want to share. It was talking about having uh, two different types of wills. Great example of a question that varies by province. And so in your province, as a result of this webinar, please book an appointment to go either review or update your will or both, because that is our line of sight. We care deeply and respect that this is not easy, but only you can take care of this for you uh, as well as your farm's benefit. Last word, Tom. Yeah, I would just, I would just end off and say that we're, there's a lot of fear of the unknown around this subject. It, it's intimidating. It's full of legal jargon. It's the easiest thing to kick the can down the road and get to it next week, next year, whatever, next decade. And all I can say to people is that you will be shocked at actually how straightforward this is. When you surround yourself with the right team of advisors, when you can do that, and, and ask a simple question like, what is, well, you keep on saying testator, what does it mean? Like, put that in proper plain language. When you get that kind of team assembled and you feel comfortable to ask that kind of question, you are going to have a great will, a great power of attorney, a phenomenal farm transition. And you're gonna have one amazing legacy because your family are, are going to remember how the farm was more than just about making money. It was about building a durable family, an extraordinary family that, that worked together and played together and celebrated together. And I just think that is, that is a life well lived. Beautifully said. Thank you, Tom. Man, that hour flew by. It does it for our time today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to plant that seed of reminder. Farm Transition Pre-Planning Estate Tool. Watch for it in spring of 2023. You will receive a link to this recording in a few days. Please take time to rewatch it with your family and share it so everyone can look at their roles on your farm to support the farm transition. You'll also receive an email shortly in your inbox with links to the event uh, evaluation form. If you've not filled out, or sorry, if you have not filled out the form to register for the rest of the event series, it will also be included. We encourage you to attend the entire series as my team that I get to be a part of as, as business advisors and other experts walk you down the path to farm transition step by step. Next up, mark your calendar, December 13th. My teammate, Joel Bokenfor, will be back talking to Merle Good about creating the right business plan for your business. 
Business and estate plans are separate steps but are dependent upon one another. Meaning if you change the business plan, you need to ask, how does this affect my will? And the same in reverse. If you change your will, how does it affect your business plan? Even if you cannot attend, be sure to register so you receive the link afterwards to watch the event. Remember, everyone who attends the entire series will also receive our certificate at the end of the rec to recognize your journey down this path with us. Tom and I hope we achieved our goal today. As a result of this webinar, you'll be motivated to book an appointment to review or update your will. On behalf of FCC, thank you for joining us today. Be well.